Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. That is absolutely all of us. Heavenly Father, we pray that tonight, by your Holy Spirit, you will open your word to our hearts and our minds, and our hearts and our minds to your word. We pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, there comes a time in the lives of individuals and societies when reality uh, has to hit hard. Chapter 15 of uh, 2 Samuel that uh, we're to study tonight records such a time in the life of uh, King David from which you need to learn. For David uh, is hugely significant in salvation history. By comparison, Abraham, the father of the faith, has 14 chapters uh, of the Bible recording his life and experiences. David, however, has 62. So perhaps you'll turn now to, to Samuel, 2 Samuel 15 on uh, page uh, 266 of the Bibles in the pews. And if you want some space to jot a few notes and uh, see where we're going, you've got that on the back page of your service sheets. And you'll see that my headings this evening are first, what is happening? Secondly, why is it happening? And thirdly, lessons for today. So first, what is happening? Well, look at verse 1 of chapter 15. After this, Absalom, he's the son uh, of uh, King David, the great ancestor of Jesus Christ. Uh, after this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now, a few words of immediate con context to uh, uh, remind us, um, uh, context for that statement. Chapter 13 of uh, 2 Samuel details the rape of Tamar, uh, Absalom's sister, by her half-brother Amnon. It details how so often immoral sexual activity means lies and deviousness for a moment's pleasure that is followed by a lifetime of pain, or in this case, death, Amnon's death. For Absalom, Tamar's brother, now took the law into his own hands and by more deceit murdered Amnon. He invited him to a party, got him drunk, and then had his servants kill him. Absalom then fled to his grandfather Talmai, the king of uh, Sheikdom uh, of Geshur, uh, some way in the northwest, on the edge of the desert along the road to Damascus. Uh, and he there spends three years in self-imposed exile, probably realizing that he's deserved and could expect the death penalty if he went back to Jerusalem. But then, as we learned last week, David allows him to come back to Jerusalem without threat of execution, but in a state of half exile. So David says, this is chapter 14, verse 24, let him dwell apart in his own house. He is not to come into my presence. And we're told he lived like that for two years. And then Absalom forced Joab, he's one of David's military commanders, to get him an audience with the king, his father, by the ruthless move of setting on fire one of Joab's field. So we read in verse 33 of chapter 14, he came to the king and bowed himself with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Without therefore any rebuke or punishment for his murdering his brother, uh, David just turns a blind eye to what has happened. Well, that's where we start with chapter 15, verse 1 and uh, which is given without any explanation. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. Well, 50 men are more than a gang. Uh, it's a mini fighting force. Absalom, in fact, is now doing his own active plotting and scheming under the very eyes of the king. Chapter 15, verses 2 to 4, tell us that Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would, say, would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, 
See, your claims are good and right, but there's no man designated by the king to hear you. So at one and the same time, uh, Absalom disloyally criticizes his father's government. Uh, there's no man designated by the king to hear you. But he then tells everyone they have a jolly good case to bring, and it's a great pity that no one is there to sort things out. Yes, he says, see, your claims are good and right. So what is the solution? Well, of course, according to Absalom, it's me being in charge of things, including the administration of justice, and all will be well. Look at verse 4. Oh, that I were judge in the land, then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And then, as they say, Abraham presses the flesh in modern uh, jargon when you canvass, this, so this in America particularly, he gives everyone a, a great hug. Verse 5, and whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom, this is an amazing phrase, stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So like a modern politician standing for office, you somehow make uh, things out to be awful as a result of someone else's leadership, while you, if in power, will bring in health, wealth, and happiness for all. But it can, of course, take some time to persuade enough people. Uh, and it took Absalom four years, at the end of which he thought he'd done enough for a coup d'etat and to get rid of his father, David. But he needed one final, really big lie or deceit. And look at verse 7. At the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord, in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I lived at Geshur in Aram, saying, If the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will offer worship to the Lord. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. And David is duped, since Absalom was doing anything but offer worship. He was forming a revolutionary army. Verse 10 says, Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king at Hebron. With Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem, who were invited guests, and they went in their innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor, from his city, Gilo. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. Then, and only then, do you get that sad verse 13 with the truth seen at last by David. A messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. But that did the trick. Because David starts now to face the situation that Absalom is conspiring, probably to kill David and uh, take over as king. And the rest of the chapter shows something of the old David coming back. He starts to think rationally. Uh, he knew Hebron and Absalom were only a few miles away. We're talking uh, of Corbridge or Morpeth, not uh, York or Edinburgh in our terms. So how to survive was the problem. He would be trapped if he stayed in Jerusalem, but the wilderness meant security uh, as he had proved himself in the past. Uh, going west uh, were the Philistines, in the south was Absalom, but going east was down to the Jordan Valley and the cave networks where you could conceal yourself. So as you read on in chapter 15, you hear how David's little army, going east, crossed the Kedron and via the Mount of Olives went towards the wilderness. So look at verse 14. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us, quickly, and bring down ruin on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out and all his household after him, and the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out and all the people after him, 
and they halted at the last they halted at the last house well so there's this little group this little army uh, made making its escape and we read later this chapter it also consisted of uh, faithful mercenaries uh, some of them were Philistines like the Cherethites and the men from Gath one of them was Ittai uh, the Gittite who seems to have recognized a new spirit in David and then there were the chief priests Abartha and Zadok but they were sent back um, to Jerusalem with the ark which David didn't want to be moved from its authorized place and he also wanted them to act as spies uh, and remaining in the city but then came that really big shock for David when he reached the Mount of Olives he was devastated here that his old advisor Ahithophel who he rated highly was not among his band of followers but was with Absalom look at verse 30 but David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives weeping as he went barefoot and with his head covered and all the people who were there who were with him covered their heads and they went up weeping as they went and it was told David Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom and David said O Lord please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness and that prayer actually was something of a turning point I suppose literally in world history because we read on from verse 32 while David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped behold Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat torn and dirt on his head David said to him if you go on with me you will be a burden to me but if you return to the city and say to Absalom I will be your servant O king as I have been your father's servant in time past so now I'll be your servant then you will defeat for me the council of Ahithophel and uh, David then explained how Hushai as an informer could liaise with Abiathar and Zadok so verse 37 says Hushai David's friend came into the city just as Absalom was entering Jerusalem and uh, God willing next year when we continue with the life of David we'll hear how Hushai made Absalom ignore Ahithophel's strategic advice which undoubtedly would have meant David's immediate defeat instead Absalom believed Hushai's alternative plan uh, this gave David time to reach a secure base and muster more support so amazingly God answered David's prayer of verse 31 O Lord please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness by providing seemingly out of the blue at the right moment uh, Hushai well all that is what was happening secondly why is it happening well there are many uh, causative factors uh, there are political factors uh, David was probably getting politically careless maybe David was just bored or weary hence careless but first and foremost was the issue of David's family and sex life Deuteronomy uh, is clear a king although he had the power to was this is Deuteronomy 17 17 not to acquire many wives for himself lest his heart turn away now when earlier David was at Hebron uh, right at the start of his kingship his firstborn Amnon his second Ahinoam his third Absalom his fourth Adonijah his fifth uh, Shephatiah and his sixth son uh, Ithriam were all born from different women polygamy of course was never said to be right uh, but gradually in the Bible people saw how wrong it was and uh, with Jesus of course teaching on uh, divorce and remarriage finally ruling it out uh, by what uh, his teaching implied uh, the Church of England bishops in 1991 put it very well when they said this summing up scripture there is in scripture an evolving convergence on the ideal of lifelong monogamous heterosexual union as the setting intended by God for the proper development of men and women as sexual beings sexual activity of any kind outside marriage comes to be seen as sinful 
and homosexual practices especially dishonourable. It is also recognised that God may call some to celibacy for particular service in his cause. Only by living within these boundaries are Christians to achieve that holiness which is pleasing to God. And that's a, a fair summary of the biblical teaching on sexual matters and marital matters. And now social science, of course, is confirming uh, that God's way, as the Bible outlines it, is for human flourishing. And so negatively in families with the non-involvement of the birth father, the consequences on average are bad, as David discovered. Professor Horsley of uh, Oxford, in his introduction to the green green groundbreaking study Families Without Fatherhood by Norman Dennis, a local uh, famous social scientist from Newcastle, and George Erda said this, no one can deny that divorce, separation, birth outside marriage and one parent families, as well as cohabitation, now we can add same sex unions and extramarital sexual intercourse have increased rapidly. Many applaud these freedoms, but what should be universally acknowledged is that the children of parents who do not follow the traditional norm, i.e. taking on personal active and long-term responsibility for the social upbringing of, their child, of the children they generate, are thereby disadvantaged in many major aspects of their chances of living a successful life. On the evidence available, such children tend to die earlier, to have more illness, to do less well at school, to exist at a level, lower level of nutrition, comfort and conviviality, to suffer more unemployment, to be more prone to deviance and crime, and finally to repeat the cycle of unstable parenting from which they themselves have suffered. Now, of course, these are just averages. It's so important to say that. And there are many parents in such disrupted families through no fault of their own. Uh, who do a fantastic job, uh, and God helps them, and some of them will be here tonight. And there are perfect families with bad outcomes for their children. However, reality has to be faced. And David was having to face reality, uh, the reality of being a bad father. Certainly, he spoiled his sons, uh, probably as compensation for not giving them the attention uh, that they should have had. Uh, just turn on to 1 Kings uh, 1, uh, which is on page 279. And uh, uh, this is when uh, I, Adonai, uh, uh, wickedly, he's another of the sons, um, after the death of Absalom, is trying to wrest the throne from Solomon. And this is the throwaway sentence. Look at verse 6 there. 1 Kings 1 verse 6, it says this, his father, that is of course David, had never at any time displeased him, that's Adonijah, by asking, why have you done thus and so? Uh, he was also a very handsome man. And there are more than hints that Absalom was similarly spoilt. David's problem though, of course, was compounded by the case of Bathsheba. From uh, that first look at Bathsheba naked, uh, there was then deceit, uh, covetousness of another man's wife, adultery, and murder. That's uh, the murder of an innocent man, Bathsheba's husband, uh, Uriah. So David was breaking at that point at least four of the Ten Commandments. And uh, Absalom's conspiracy, and all David had to suffer as a result, was present judgment for these sins. Nathan the prophet made God's verdict clear. This is 2 Samuel 12, verse 10. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin, you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. So uh, David had to face reality. Forgiven, yes, 
but there would still be social consequences uh, in this life. And yes, God could use those social consequences to teach David great lessons, which he was able to teach others, millions, through his Psalms. But certainly, spiritually, David's relationship with God was restored, yes. But Absalom would still conspire against David and fulfill that prophecy. So thirdly, and finally, and very briefly, lessons for today. Well, first, these sad and uh, sordid events in the Old Testament, the New Testament says, this is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, as we heard earlier, took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So we're to be warned by David and Absalom. The problems behind 1 Corinthians 10 were from Moses' time, but also sexual immorality and grumbling, a form uh, often of disloyalty, exactly what we've had to consider tonight in uh, 2 Samuel. And they are still today's temptations, for sexual temptation is now made so easy, and it always has been easy to be disloyal in the family, at work, or wherever. And, but what happens when you are tempted? Well, listen to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now, these things happen to them, that's in the Old Testament times, as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. That is absolutely all of us. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So never think you are too good to be tempted. Perhaps someone here tonight knows how relevant the case of David is uh, for them. So on this Palm Sunday, as we look ahead to Good Friday, and the possibility uh, through the cross of Christ of forgiveness and Easter day and uh, Christ's resurrection and new life by his Holy Spirit. Let me leave uh, you some words that uh, can never be repeated too often. They're from Hebrews 4 verses 14 to 16 and some of these we heard this morning. And with them I conclude. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I wonder who needs to do that right now. Shall we all of us pray? And these Old Testament uh, facts and narratives and descriptions are meant to challenge us and make us think and take stock. So let's pray individually as we need to pray and appropriately for our own situations. Remember that uh, uh, David did repent and he wrote that wonderful Psalm 51 but uh, he had to learn hard lessons and so do we